Well, welcome back to Way of the Wrench and another episode of How to Become a Welder. On today's very special episode, I'm gonna show you how to use one of these, a MIG welder. So instead of staring at this dusty thing sitting in the corner of your shop, let's show you how to use it, get all hooked up and uh, get you doing some cool projects. So let's go. All right, in the interest of saving time, I have decided that this video is only gonna be on the proper setup of a MIG welding machine so that you can get going and practicing your welding. I will make a future video on how to diagnose your problems with MIG welding and how to become a better MIG welder. And also, I'm not gonna be doing much of the electric safety stuff for the MIG welder. All of that is in a great video that I will put the link above for you. Um, so make sure that you watch that one before you try anything in this video. So out of all the welders in the shop, why am I setting up a MIG welder? Well, first thing is that it is very fast. With the push of a button, I've got a whole spool of wire that will continuously feed out and I can just weld and weld and weld. As opposed to the other processes where I've got filler rods that I have to keep grabbing for or uh, electrodes in a stick welder that's getting used up and I have to switch that out as well. Second thing is it is very versatile. With the flick of a couple knobs I can go from little tack welds on thin sheet metal all the way up to half inch plate no problem. And the last one is there is virtually no cleanup. I don't have any slag to chip off and wire brush between stops and starts and when set up properly there is very little spatter. So starting right at the top behind me here I have a MIG welder otherwise known as a GMAW process or GMAW in industry, which is gas metal arc welder. Now, MIG also is an abbreviation and it stands for metal inert gas. Now, when we're talking about gases in these titles, what we're referring to is what's inside this high pressure cylinder at the back. That is our inert gas. Now, the air that you and I breathe that's around us when we start welding is not good for electric welding. In fact, when we start melting that metal to extremely high temperatures, the oxygen, nitrogen and hydrogen in the air actually react and oxidize or burn our welds as we're going. And uh, that tends to look like black and brown carbon, lots of spatter and lots of little bubbles and holes in our weld, which is called porosity. Now, one of the best ways I explain it to my students is that think of the oxygen in the air going into our liquid metal puddle and bubbling it up and frothing it up. And then as that weld cools down and solidifies, you're left with Swiss cheese, full of little holes. And we don't want that in our welds because it makes it weak. The type of inert gas that you're gonna use for your welding setup will differ depending on what you're welding. So you're gonna to have to look into that. Um, but for this video, we're gonna talk about kind of like the most common general purpose welding steel setup. And so for mine, my inert gas is something called Argo Shield, which is a mix of 75% argon and 25% carbon dioxide. That gives me best results for welding steel. When you go to open up your high pressure cylinder here, remember that these are a double sealing valve, which means you have to open this all the way till it stops moving. Otherwise it'll leak in and waste the gas out the side. Not a bad idea to not be staring at these gauges when you're opening them up. Uh, they have been cases where they can blow out on you. And when you're opening up the valve, instead of dumping 3000 PSI under this gauge, just go nice and slow, watch the needles creep up. And once it stops moving, then you can kind of open it up as fast as you want. And if you forgot which way, it literally is stamped on the valve, which way to open. So counterclockwise, open it up until it stops moving. Now attached to the cylinder is our regulator and it regulates the high pressure coming from the cylinder down to a more useful flow for while we're welding. So this gauge tells us what the bottle pressure is. So right now we're about 1200 PSI. This knob, you can adjust or lower the flow rate coming out of our nozzle. Now, one important thing when you're adjusting this, not a bad idea to have your machine on and hit the trigger. That way for a couple seconds, you have the actual flow rate coming out of the torch and you can adjust it properly. Now, some good starting points for uh, what you should have for flow. I would go 20 to 40 cubic feet per hour. Um, if you've got it too low, you basically don't have enough gas out here to make a cloud and so oxygen can get in. And then if you got it higher than 40, first off, it's pretty high. You're probably wasting a lot of gas. But the second thing is if you've got the gas flowing out of here so fast, it actually can make a little bit of turbulence, which can actually suck in oxygen and it kind of defeats the purpose. Now, the other thing that happens when you push the button on the torch here is you have a spool of wire inside the machine, otherwise known as your consumable electrode. It's going to get fed down the liner to the end of your nozzle by this drive mechanism. And as soon as that wire touches your workpiece or whatever you have hooked up to your ground clamp, that's when the magic happens and the welding starts like this. Woo! 
Now how fast we want that wire to come out and how hot we want our welding to be or how much voltage we want to use is set by these two dials here, but we don't really know what they are. So in the inside of this flippable lid here on these machines is a chart. That chart's going to tell you how to set this. So let's take a look at it. Now the first time you look at one of these charts, it's going to be really overwhelming because there's a ton of information, but don't get too discouraged. There's only really three things you need to know to be able to do this. First one is what is the gas that you're using in your inert gas cylinder? So for us, we are using Argo Shield, which is 75% argon, 25% CO2. So that takes away everything else on this chart. We don't need to know anything down here. We're just worried about these rows. Now, the second thing we need to know about is the wire diameter that we're using on our spool. And in this scenario, we are using 0 0.035 inches. So now we only have to worry about this row right here. And then the only other thing we need to know is what is the thickness of the material that we're welding. So we can look right here and see if we already know what the size is, or we could go measure it. Or an even simpler way is just grab the piece of material that you're welding. And on this one, they've even got kind of like a shadowed out section, match it up with the thickness. And then all you do is you cross-reference that thickness with that wire speed, and that'll tell you what you're doing. So for example, this guy here, this would be under the V symbol, that's your voltage. You're gonna set it to 18 volts. And the little symbol with two circles and a wire in between, that's your wire speed. You're gonna set it to 240. Now a really good MIG welder will also put extra information on this panel. So for example, this one here, it has all of the parts for this MIG welder and their part numbers. So if we ever wear out or break something, the ordering of those parts will be really quite easy. All right, once you've got your settings, go ahead and turn your machine on and then set your voltage and your wire speed. So we wanted 18 volts and 240 wire speed. Okay, now keep in mind, this is a good starting point for the material that you're using, and uh, you may find that it is too hot or too cold. So if that's the case, you can tweak these numbers, but do not just kind of randomly guess what they should be. I highly recommend you go back to the chart and look at a hotter setting or a colder setting, whatever you need, and use those numbers. That way you can dial in and get some great welding happening. Now this drive mechanism, once it's set up, you don't actually have to change much on it. But uh, when you first get your machine, you will have to make sure that the drive rollers are set up properly for the thickness or the diameter of the wire you're using. So in this case, I'm using 0 0.035 inches. So that's going to be set up for the right groove on those wheels. Now, the other thing you got to be concerned about is how tight is this drive mechanism grabbing the rod and feeding it through into your liner. If it's too loose, then you're going to have feed issues where the wire kind of spits and spurts and doesn't really come out steady. That's too low of tension. And the other problem is if you have this too tight, especially on softer materials like aluminum, you can actually damage the welding rod and um, change the shape of it so that when it gets to the end of the electrode where it touches your contact tip, you can actually have some issues that way too. So uh, this is a nice machine. It's got a little kind of gauge at the back and it tells you what number is proper setting for what material you're using. Um, however, there is another trick and I'm gonna show you that right now. If your MIG welder doesn't have a graphic back here to tell you how tight to tension this, I'm gonna show you a trick here. So what you do is you back this off and at the same time, I can kind of show you how this works. So I swing this to the side and you'll notice that this drive wheel is actually on a hinged arm. So when we are increasing the tension or tightening this, you can see that we are actually grabbing the wire harder and that's what's driving the wire down the liner. This is also how you'd get in here to change these drive wheels in case you uh, wanna put a different diameter wire inside your machine. So put that back down, put this back out. And here's the trick. So you take your gun, get a piece of metal that is not hooked up to your ground clamp because you don't want to flash your eyes with ultraviolet light when you do this and hold it kind of just a bit past 45 degree angle. And when you hit the button, because we have very little tension on those drive wheels, it's going to slip back here and the wire won't move. And so the trick is, is as you're holding the wire, you increase the tension and eventually this will start kicking it and it'll start making kind of like a, a circle about that big. And that's the trick that's uh, when you stop for the tension. So, like this. Like that. That is the proper tension for this machine. Okay, let's take a look at the front of this machine and figure out what our settings are. Now, keep in mind, I'm showing you on this machine, uh, whatever you have at home is gonna be different. So you're gonna have to take a look at your owner's manual and figure out your own settings. Now, generally what I find is the lower end, cheaper machines are gonna have just two knobs. You're gonna have voltage and wire speed to adjust. And then the higher end you go, uh, some of these things have 50 knobs and levers on there. And now uh, you gotta look it up, figure out what it is for you. So let's look at ours. So looking at the front of this 256 Power Mig from Lincoln Electric, there's not a lot going on here, which is kind of the reason why I picked it for my students. Um, we already know some of this. So this one here with the V, that's volts. That's pretty easy. 
to figure out the wire speed. It's WFS, so wire feed speed. And the symbol is basically two little drive rollers with a wire and one knob to control that, so that's good. We got our on off switch right here. And then we got these ones, so I'm gonna zoom in here so we can see these individually. Starting all the way at the left here, we have our trigger, which is a two step or a four step. Now what they're talking about is how many steps or how many motions do you have to do to turn the welding on and off? So for a two step, which is the most common, that means one step is pulling the button on the gun and getting the welding action to start. And then as soon as you want it to stop, you let it go, hence two steps. Now the four steps, this is used when you have a lot of continuous welding and you don't really wanna to have to worry about holding that button down the whole time. So for that motion, it looks like this. Pull the trigger down, nothing starts yet. And then when you do the second step, it releases. Now it starts to automatically weld for you and keeps feeding out. And it will not shut off until you push the trigger again and let it out again, hence the four steps. So that's that one. Now spot time, this is really good when you have to make a lot of tack welds on a piece and you want the tack welds to be all the same size. In other words, the same amount of time that you've put into the welding for each individual one. So instead of having to count kind of in your head and go one second, two second and let go, this is gonna automatically do that for you. So you just set it to whoever, how many seconds you want it to do, pull the trigger and start welding and you'll find that as you're welding, it will just automatically stop when it gets to the time that you've set there. So the next setting is run in and we are setting it in inches per minute. Now what this is, is when you start your welding initially, uh, this will lower or decrease the amount of wire speed so that there's a better start to your arc and it prevents burn back. So you can adjust that to make it slower or faster. Now, after a couple seconds, it does go back to whatever the wire speed is that you've set for the machine. So this is just for the start or the run-in of your weld. The last setting is burn back. Now, what we're talking about is that when you are welding and you get your finger on the button, the wire is continuously feeding out. And as soon as you stop, the welding stops and this wire will be sticking out a certain distance from your contact tip. Now, if you find that it is too short, it's gonna start sticking to your contact tip all the time. Or if it's too long, then you are starting too far away from your material for your every single start. So you can adjust that length with your burn back. So what you'll find is if this wire is too short, the burn back is how much time you are allowing this to continue to feed after you've let go of the button so that it's a little bit longer. So I can just increase the time to increase the length. All right, the next thing you need is your ground clamp. Now you're gonna put this directly to your workpiece that you are welding on, or if you want, you can put it on a table, but make sure that it is electrically conductive, meaning that you do not have it on a wooden table. It's gotta be metal and there's no paint or rust or anything that's gonna inhibit the electricity from flowing through the workpiece to the table and back to your ground clamp and back to the machine. Now a really useful tool that I would buy along with a MIG welder is one of these MIG welding pliers. Now they've got a lot of useful functions on them. So first one here, this little part here is for grabbing the nozzle and undoing it in case it's too tight. So you can spin the nozzle off. We've got a cutter here so that if we wanna trim the length of our wire, we can do that. There's also a spot here that's perfectly sized to grab the contact tip so we can crack that loose and undo and change those. And then to top it all off, the outside of these jaws have serrations on them. And uh, that allows you to take your nozzle and actually clean out all of the spatter inside here for your next weld. You just kind of go back and forth like this. If you've got some really big chunks, you can kind of grab them at the end of the pliers and kind of pry them off. And get this all nice and clean. So you can start Weld. I tend to do this right at the very beginning before I start, but I'm starting with a nice clean setup here. I just put this on hand tight, you don't need to use the pliers. All right, cool. All right, the MIG welder's all set up and you're ready to weld in your project, but there are a couple things that I recommend you do before you start. First thing is make sure you got all the recommended PPE or personal protection equipment before you get started, that way you are safe. And it takes a minute to just take a look around your area, make sure there is nothing that's going to be danger while you are welding. Now, second thing I recommend is you go out to your scrap bin and you find a piece of steel in there that's the same thickness as the project or the welding sample that you're gonna do. And you're gonna use this for the first couple of weld beads to try out your settings. Make sure you haven't screwed something up like you don't have the gas on or it's too hot or too cold. 
And then when you got this laying out welds just how you want on your project, then you go ahead and start on your project or your weld sample. Now, when you push the trigger and the welding starts, there's a tendency to start moving the torch right away. And that's not what you want to do. That actually creates kind of like a flat, hollow start to your weld bead. You want to pause for about half a second, maybe even a second or so. If you watch your puddle, you'll see that metal is getting in there and it's making a little bit of a bead. Some heat's gone in and then you can start your moving. Now, as you start moving, have your gun in a position that you can see what you're doing, see where you're going. You can see that you're maintaining that 3 8 stick out. And when you first start welding, just focus on trying to be steady. Don't worry so much about being too fast or too slow. You'll watch the puddle for all that guidance, but uh, just go a steady speed. And then when you're done, you can look at your weld bead and see if it's too slow or too fast. Now, same thing, when you get to the end of the puddle, don't just stop the trigger and pull it away. You're going to want to pause for half a second and keep welding. That way you don't have a crater or once again, a hole or a flat spot in your weld bead. So put some material in there and then let go of the trigger, but leave the gas nozzle there for a couple seconds while that liquid metal is solidifying. That way you don't have any problems with porosity. All right, let's take a look at this weld bead and make sure this welder is set up properly. Now, first thing I'm gonna be looking for is do I have a good enough gas shielding cloud? So first thing is I don't see any porosity. I don't have any excessive spatter or black or brown soot around here. So that gas shield is there and it's doing its job. Now, the second thing is the wire speed and the voltage settings. I'm looking for how this weld bead looks on this material. What I ideally want is kind of like a semicircle kind of shape to it. I don't want it sitting up like a worm on the surface or like bird poop. That means it's too cold and it's not flat or even concave and melting through. So that's not too hot. So this is a good heat setting, a good wire speeds. Now, as for my personal welding settings, uh, when I had the wire sticking out that three eighths of an inch, uh, I must not have crept up on this, the distance because I don't see any excessive spatter. So that looks okay. And you can see at the beginning and at the end of my weld beads, there are no craters or holes. So I must have paused long enough to fill them up, get some heat in there and not just pulled the torch away at the very end. So this machine I would say is set up properly and ready to go on our project. All right, at the end of the day, when you're done your welding, it's always a good idea to take care of these machines. That way they're ready for you when you need them. So first off, shut off the machine take the ground cable off of the table and wrap it up on the MIG welder unless you are using it permanently on a setup and leave it on the table. Uh, the torch itself, wrap it up, that way the liner is not on the ground getting stomped on, rolled over and damaged and needing replaced later. And then the last thing is shut the main cylinder valve off for your gas all the way clockwise and I would leave the regulator settings where they're at, you don't have to back them off. That way this thing is set up for you the next time you use it. Hey, there you go. There's another video from Way of the Wrench and on how to become a welder, this time on how to set up a MIG welder and so you can get going and practicing and making some wicked awesome weld beads. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, put them down below and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. And stay tuned for a future video which will be nothing but how to diagnose your MIG welding beads, whether they are too hot, too cold, no gas, too much stick out, too fast, too slow, all that good stuff. Uh, if you'd like to know more about what's going on in the shop here, always follow us on Instagram. Way of the wrench. Till next time, take it easy.